In May 2023, a New York jury found the former US President Donald Trump liable for sexually assaulting the writer E. Jean Carroll back in the mid-1990s. Former President Trump is vowing to appeal after being found liable of sexual abuse and defamation. In less than three hours, the jury found Donald Trump liable for sexually abusing E. Jean Carroll. Many have speculated as to whether this ruling in a civil court could damage Trump's 2024 presidential campaign. Though some believe it won't make a substantial difference. The fact that Trump is a candidate for president means that the American public has to decide how they feel about these allegations, whether they believe Carroll, whether they agree with the jury's ruling, and whether it matters for how they vote. But these questions aren't unique to politics. They happen whenever someone, and it's usually a man, is accused of sexual misconduct, be that in an office or in another institution, like a place of worship. Today, we speak with a scholar whose research seeks to understand what makes some people more inclined to support perpetrators of sexual misconduct than their victims. I'm Gemma Ware, and this is The Conversation Weekly, the world explained by experts. To help introduce our story today, I'm joined by the Business and Economy Editor at The Conversation in Canada, Eleni Vlahiotis. Eleni, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Today, we're talking about attitudes around sexual harassment in the workplace. And there's this word that I had never come across before, empathy, which is used to talk about this in recent studies. What does empathy mean? Yes. So empathy is a term that was coined by Australian philosopher Kate Mann in a 2018 op-ed for The New York Times. She defines this word as the inappropriate and disproportionate sympathy powerful men often enjoy in cases of sexual assault, intimate partner violence, homicide, and other misogynistic behavior. Um, so often you see this response of empathy in statements like she's ruining his life by coming forward or think of his career or his family. And obviously we're not here to litigate any particular case or accusation, but these responses reveal what someone who's being harassed has to be willing to risk when they actually come forward with an allegation in their workplace or wherever else they are. Yeah. And what we know is that gender discrimination and sexual harassment is still a huge problem in workplaces around the world. And of course, it does vary in degree from a single comment to creating a hostile work environment all the way up to sexual assault. And when the victims, most often women, come forward and make allegations, they can experience what's called double victimization. So not only have they been experiencing this harassment, but now they're ostracized and not believed by their colleagues. And in many cases, the allegations go largely unaddressed and the victim ends up being transferred to a different department or even changing jobs, which of course can really affect their careers. The men who are accused, on the other hand, often experience no serious repercussions at all. It's extra cruel, this double victimization. Mm -hmm. You've been working with some researchers who've been involved in a recent set of studies looking into people's attitudes towards sexual harassment allegations. So this isn't actually even people who are involved in the allegations, but third parties, people who are just observers, co-workers, or even people who have an opinion on social media. Right. One of the authors of the study is Dr. Samantha Dodson, an assistant professor of organizational behavior and human resources in the Haskins School of Business at the University of Calgary. I was really struck by her research on this and how it allows us to consider these sorts of situations from a whole new perspective. And you introduced her to us so we could find out a bit more about this research. Thanks very much, Danny, for coming on and giving us some context before that conversation. My pleasure. When I called up Samantha Dodson a few weeks ago, I asked her what led her to start thinking about the different ways people react to accusations of sexual harassment. So for this research in particular, uh, we started the project around the Me Too movement in October 2017. So it started seeing social media posts worldwide of women saying, Me Too, I've been sexually harassed at work. In early October 2017, the New York Times and The New Yorker published allegations from multiple women of sexual harassment and assault against media mogul Harvey Weinstein. Allegations by numerous women who say the Hollywood mogul sexually harassed them. His alleged victims... A few weeks later, the actress Alyssa Milano tweeted, if all the women who've been sexually harassed or assaulted wrote Me Too as the status, we might give people a sense of the magnitude of the problem. The hashtag was tweeted nearly a million times in just 48 hours. The cultural logjam seemed to burst after the Weinstein accusers came forward. The hashtag Me Too has millions of women sharing stories of abuse. Abuse. 
as thousands of women published their experiences of sexual harassment and abuse. Twitter lit up with the responses of both support and criticism. And it just was so powerful to me to see people come together and to use social media to start talking about these difficult topics and to really build solidarity. But what really drove this research was watching what happened when Christine Blasey Ford came forward with allegations of sexual assault against now Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh during the uh, nomination process. In September 2018, Donald Trump nominated Brett Kavanaugh for Associate Justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. Over the course of the congressional hearings for his approval, a person from his past, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, came forward to testify under oath that when the two of them were in high school, Kavanaugh had sexually assaulted her, something that he denied. I am here today not because I want to be. I am terrified. I am here because I believe it is my civic duty to tell you what happened to me while Brett Kavanaugh and I were in high school. And the vitriol, she was getting death threats. You know, she had to move from her home and have security and it really just upended her life. And I was just a bit shocked by how vitriolic the conversation was around her um, with people seemingly not interested or caring about this distressing event that had happened to her. They seemed more focused on how her allegations were harming Brett Kavanaugh or his family. And I just found that really fascinating. Samantha and her colleagues wanted to get to the heart of why third parties, such as people on social media, react the way they do to allegations of sexual harassment. We really wanted to understand why are some people predisposed to be empathetic or to feel the success of sympathy toward male perpetrators of uh, sexual misconduct? And what are the repercussions in the workplace? How do those people who experience sympathy end up treating the perpetrator versus treating the victim? So our work focused on the moral values that might lead one to feel empathetic. We use what's called moral foundations theory to guide our theory development and also how we collected our data. And moral foundations theory argues that there are innate, basic moral concerns that everybody has to different levels that have evolved over time. And so these concerns include respect for authority, being loyal to your in-group, staying pure and clean. It also includes being fair and being caring or compassionate toward other people. So the theory argues that we all hold these, you know, to different levels, perhaps I care a lot about being fair to other people. Uh, maybe you care more so about respecting authority and those moral concerns that we have are going to change the way that we see the world and what we think is right and wrong and how we treat other people. Samantha and her colleagues worked on five different but related studies to examine how these moral values might influence people's reactions to allegations of sexual misconduct. The first two studies looked at social media reactions, one to the allegations against Harvey Weinstein and the Me Too movement, and another to Christine Blasey Ford's testimony against Brett Kavanaugh. They collected tweets aimed at both the women making allegations and the men accused of sexual harassment, and they evaluated whether the tweets were supportive of the alleged perpetrator or the person making the allegations. So the tweets would be, you know, something like, hey, at Harvey Weinstein, I can't believe you did this, you're a terrible person. They use what's called a dictionary approach in their analysis, matching certain words and phrases with the five values of moral foundations theory. They then gauged how many words in a person's tweet were related to each value. So if the topic is loyalty and we are trying to capture whether somebody cares about loyalty, they might use words like loyal. They might use phrases like, you know, stick with the team, I support X, Y, Z. So we're looking for those words. The third and fourth studies were more traditional psychology experiments with a group of people in a lab. Study three was a more traditional, I would say, psychological experiment where we provided information to the participants around a sexual harassment allegation and then asked them to report you know, how much sympathy they were feeling, how much anger they were feeling, uh, and then you know, our dependent variables of credibility and desired punishment. 
The fourth study was similar to the third, except that rather than providing participants with a fictional story of sexual harassment, the researchers asked participants to share their own real experiences. So in this case, we asked them, have you ever heard of two co-workers that in one of your organizations that you've worked for, uh, where one accused the other of sexual harassment? Tell us the story. Tell us everything you remember about it, everything you were feeling and thinking in the moment. And then we measured, again, those dependent variables of emotions of sympathy and anger toward each party involved, credibility and desired punishment. So when you've done all that analysis, what you're trying to do is then draw up a picture both from different people on social media and also people in your lab for their reactions to either something that they've heard about in their life or something that they've witnessed happening in, in the public and kind of their moral values. So what were your conclusions then about how sexual harassment and the attitudes people have towards alleged offenders and victims depends on their moral values. What we found is that when people strongly value things like loyalty, respect for authority and purity, they're more likely to feel sympathy toward the man accused of sexual misconduct and feel anger toward the women who made that allegation. This has important downstream effects um, where it negatively affects the victim's credibility. So people are less likely to believe her, to see her as truthful and factual in her information sharing. And it also leads to people being more likely to seek punishment for the women who made the accusations and less likely to seek punishment for the men who have been accused. In the paper, we talk about authority, loyalty, and purity as binding foundations. This is a phrase that's used in moral foundations research because oftentimes these three moral concerns kind of hang together and fairness and care often hang together where if you are high on one, you're high on loyalty, you probably also care about authority and purity to a higher level. Huh. And, and when we're talking about authority, this could be a company, could be an institution, mm -hmm. or also mm -hmm. church. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Mm. What about the flip side of it then? So the people who were not empathetic. The vast majority of our participants across all of our studies are not empathetic. So we're really talking about a small subset who are going to have a tendency to be empathetic. The challenge is if those people are in positions of authority uh, or even not in positions of authority, if, if you have one person that you work with who's empathetic and you're a victim, you might you know, experience some iciness from them or ostracism or however they decide to respond to you. The good news is most people will not respond mm. in that way. And so most people's values are therefore more on the caring and respect side. Is that it? Or how does it fall that side? Not necessarily. So again, people hold these moral values to varying levels. So for you, right, you probably care about authority to some extent. Um, and that I just do, might actually. be added. Yeah, yeah <laughs> like there's a, there's a value to it, right? That's why it's a moral value, right? So it's not to say that, you know, there's either people who care about authority, loyalty and purity and don't care at all about fairness and caring or vice versa. People are just okay. going to have different levels mm. across the five. And all I can say for our research is that people who are higher in being concerned about loyalty, authority and purity are more likely to be empathetic. Was there a gender dynamic to it? Across all of my research, we typically find that women tend to be more supportive of other women than men do. But there are certainly empathetic women as well. And in fact, I don't know if you remember, but one of the motivations for this research was there was a hashtag that started kind of encounter to the Me Too hashtag that said him too. What about him? Him too. Like he's being punished for these allegations. Um, and that was actually started by a mother about her son. And that hashtag gained a lot of traction among women. In writing about your, your research, you've, you've written about people who highly value respect for authority, loyalty and purity tend to view behaviour that threatens the stability of groups and institutions as immoral. And, and then you build on that to say that sexual misconduct allegations 
against men in positions of authority in those people's lives could actually be seen as offensive to those people who endorse those values. And to me, that's really fascinating because what you're saying is the people who are even dismissive or aggressive towards victims of sexual harassment will have an attitude because they fear the instability that this alleged victim is introducing to their life. And many people don't like instability, they hate change and uncertainty. Yeah. So that just kind of might be a threat to their community or to their, their company or the institution that they hold dear and it could meet, lead to major changes. So like, I guess even though I strongly disagree with that sentiment as a person, I kind of see where they're coming from. Um, did you find that you came away in your research understanding even a little bit more about why people might feel this way? Yeah, yeah, I think I, I did come away with more of an understanding. Like you said, that's what we argue here, that it, it creates a sense of instability. Um, you're rocking the boat. Um, and to me, I was like, well, why should that matter? Let's rock the boat. Let's upend institutions. Let's, you know, radically change the way that the society functions so that we're better protecting and supporting, you know, historically marginalized folks. But this did help me understand, you know, the perspectives of why that could be distressing to people, how, you know, perhaps there are ways that we can work within those fears and those concerns to help make change together. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a literature around moral foundations that talks about how if we can reframe issues to better match people's moral concerns, that sometimes that can help them, uh, you know, better understand those issues and perhaps buy into them. This was the jumping off point for Samantha's fifth study, which looked at whether the way a manager responds to allegations of sexual harassment in the workplace influenced the outcomes for the victim and the perpetrator. The researchers did this through a lab-based experiment with more than 800 participants. They were looking to see how people would respond to the way managers reacted to sexual harassment allegations. In the study, the managers were either openly siding with the victim, openly showing empathy for the perpetrator, or remaining neutral. We had managers frame the victim's behaviour in coming forward as actually a loyal thing to do for the organisation, which in some ways it is, right? The argument was actually very easy to make, that if we want our organisation to last, if we want it to be safe and profitable and you know a solid institution, well, people sexually harassing other people within the organisation is not working toward those goals. And what we did find in that study is that it's best if managers either say something supportive of the victim or choose to stay neutral. But if managers disparage the victim in any way, it almost gives permission to people who are empathetic to just be even more empathetic. But even when the managers reframed the victim's allegations as loyal behaviour, it didn't change the opinions of their empathetic colleagues. It did, however, stop them from ostracising victims. We found that this had the same effect as being neutral. So unfortunately, it didn't sway empathetic folks to you know, change their minds and be more sympathetic and less angry at this victim for coming forward. But if you spoke about them in the same loyalty terms, but in a negative light, right, that they were disloyal to the organization for coming forward, that they were threatening the stability of this organization, that's when we really saw empathetic folks feel even more licensed to you know, punish the victim and support the perpetrator. This fifth study also yielded some recommendations for businesses about how to handle allegations of sexual misconduct. The first of which is whenever possible to bring in third parties to investigate any claims. You want to bring in people who aren't going to come in with any sort of bias um, or preconceived notion about who's right and who's wrong in these claims. Um, but we also recognize that that can be expensive and might not always be accessible, particularly to perhaps smaller organizations. And so what we would also recommend doing is that if you are going to investigate in-house, to make that a committee Instead of just one person who might be biased to protect the perpetrator, if you can bring in a group of people, particularly if they are from different ranks in the organization or different departments, to help investigate, we're hopeful that this will prevent any one person from 
protecting the perpetrator and inadvertently harming the victim. Samantha told me the follow-up studies she's now doing are also indicating that the most effective response in many of these situations in the workplace is a simple apology. I do have some work right now building off these studies that are looking at how the perpetrator's response then affects how these third parties feel about the victims. So you get the allegation, and then oftentimes the perpetrator will come back and say something. They might deny the allegation, say this never happened. They might apologize, or they might say nothing. And traditionally, the legal argument has been deny or say nothing, right? Do not accept responsibility for this allegation. But what we're finding in these follow-up studies is that the third parties, people are craving apologies, that actually we're seeing less negative outcomes for perpetrators and victims when people that have been accused of harassment apologize instead of avoiding the issue or denying it. So it actually could be in the institution's interest to Hmm. uh, encourage apologies. Are you optimistic then about changes in workplace culture and attitudes that might come about through understanding a bit more about why people feel certain ways and what leaders can do to kind of shift shift the power dynamics, I guess, yeah. as to who, who's in charge and who, who influences conversations? Uh, yes, I am absolutely optimistic. You know, I see my students in the classroom and they are so concerned about not just issues of sexual harassment, but of racism and homophobia and all of these kind of social issues, they are bringing them into the business school. And they're saying, we want to know how to address these issues. We don't want the workplaces that we are going to be building to be the same as what our parents' workplaces were like and what our grandparents' workplaces are like. So from that perspective, yes, I am incredibly optimistic of the students that are leaving business schools and coming in to the workplace. The shifts are going to be slow, but I think we're going to get there. Well, thank you so much, Samantha. That's been a really great overview of your research and and where you're heading as well. So thank you for explaining it all to us. Thank you so much for having me on. That's it for this week's show. Thanks to our colleague Eleni Vlahiotis at The Conversation in Canada, who we heard from at the top of the show. This episode was written and produced by Katie Flood, with production assistance from Mend Marawani. Sound design was by Michelle Macklem, and our theme music is by Nita Saal. Stephen Kahn is our global executive editor, and I'm Gemma Ware, the executive producer. You can connect with us on Instagram at theconversation.com or email us directly at podcast at theconversation.com. Do sign up for The Conversation's free daily newsletter by clicking on the link in our show notes. The Conversation is a not-for-profit news outlet dedicated to sharing the work of academic experts with the wider public. If you like what we do, please support us at donate.theconversation.com and please rate and review the podcast wherever you listen. Thanks for listening.